remember when you first entered into the world? Because I don't. And I'm sure you all don't either. But when we enter into the world, we are basically a clean slate. We are empty of all concepts and values, but over time, through experiences, we begin to form and cement key concepts that remain with us for the rest of our lives. For example, for some of us, we were taught the concept of what it meant to be nice, that hitting was not nice, and that helping was nice. And so in order to fill this slate, we need a language and we need experiences. And so our language and experiences go from googly goo talk words to then sentences to then being able to have these descriptive monologues that demonstrate how we make meaning in the world. And so here's my niece, Sarah Joan. And we were outside in the yard on this one spring day and we were having a shared experience. And she just had this fascination with finding bugs. And she would pick them up and she would stare at them two inches from her face. She had no fear of these bugs and it was so beautiful. I, on the other hand, was a little bit freaked out. <laughs> but I didn't want my fear of bugs to be passed on to her. And so instead, I encouraged her and found more experiences for her to find bugs. And so on this day, she finds a bug. And as you can see, she is very intrigued by it. And she is so intrigued by it that she is determined to have or possess this bug. And so before, before this experience with my niece, she had to have at least tried or tested the concept of ownership. Because when she turned to me and she said, my bug, I said, oh, is that your bug? And she responded back to me, yes, my bug. And so she had learned this concept from somewhere and probably within her local environment around her. And she tried and tested this concept and we've all done this because we have to try and test concepts within our shared experience in our, with the people that we have shared experiences with and our environment. And so when she was saying things like my bottle or my toy or my cup, somebody reinforced it with her by saying, why yes, that is your bottle. And so, and so she goes from that moment to really understanding that she can own things. And this is a common routine that we have with the kids in our lives. Because if you've ever been around toddlers at all, you've probably heard the word mine. And so it took me a minute to realize the impact that that day had had on my niece and I. That day that I affirmed and confirmed with her the concept of ownership, that you could indeed own a bug. And so in my everyday work, I am a language revitalist or something like that. We don't really have a working title because in indigenous communities, surrounding language loss, we don't really sit around and come up with a working title for what we do because we really don't have time. We're more focused on the revival and survival of our languages. So bottom line is, I have a passion for promoting the bringing back of indigenous languages. And so I was working with a neighboring language and I had learned how to say hand, me, my, and I thought that I could insert any object after those words. And so I approached a fluent speaker, and I said rather confidently, hand me my water, in her language. And she turned to me with a frown, and she said, not only could I not say that word, but I couldn't even say it at all. And I was really confused because I was like, I, I knew I had said all of those words correctly, and so when I turned to her and I asked her, and I said, well, well what did I say that was wrong? What, what can I say? 
And she said to me that you couldn't use the word my with anything in the natural world. You couldn't use the word my with anything in the natural world? What? <laughs> Was what my inside face said. But my outside face said, oh, oh, you can't. Because what she said to me made no sense at all. And so those of us that have ever been in this situation, when something doesn't make sense, we make it make sense. And so I made it make sense by doing this. I thought, well, if I can't use the word my with anything in the natural world, like tree, rock, or water, well, I could then use it with car, or shoe, or money, because those things can't be found in the natural world. And so I was working with, well, I had went to visit my language colleague in Canada, and I was sharing, him, sharing with him this experience that I'd had where this elder told me about her language and about how you couldn't use the word my with anything in the natural world. And all of a sudden, this huge, this ginormous realization hit me. And I believe it went something like this. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God! <laughs> and I turned to him and I said, do you think that maybe what she was saying is that in her language, they don't have the concept of ownership? And that was such a shock to me, that realization, that possibility, that I had to put my learning of my language aside. And I went out on a research journey with this in mind. What if there is no concept of ownership in my language? And what if I had been forcing unnatural concepts into the language of my people? And what if my efforts were actually changing the true essence of my people forever? And so my first stop on my language research journey was with this word my. And what I found was, was that with this word my, was that when used in its proper form, it is used to say, my mom, my dad, my daughter, my son, that kind of my. And it's not really interchangeable like how we use it in English. Because when we say my mom, we're not saying, I own or possess my mother. We're saying that I have a bond or a connection, a relationship with that person that I use the word my with. Because when we say my shoe, we're not saying that I have a bond or a connection with that shoe. We're saying that I own or I possess a shoe. And so at this point, I allowed myself to have this kind of awakening, this kind of taking on a belief that perhaps there was a world in my world that didn't have ownership. And what began to happen was these stories just began to emerge. And stories of my ancestors, and this is, this is one that we all know, is when that the Bitterroot Salish, when the government came in and they told my ancestors, my chiefs, that they had to give up their way of life. They had to give up hunting and gathering and take on this world of farming. That they were given a piece of paper and they were told that that piece of paper meant that they now owned land. And another colleague told me that her mother and grandmother were walking through land that they had walked through forever, and they were all nearly killed because they didn't understand the concept of trespassing, and they were on a new settler's land. And so at this point, I had to think about things deeper. And this elder told me, she opened my eyes and because she, she told me that there's this old saying, adapt or die. And, and this realization hit me that, wow, that's what had happened, is that my people had to take on this concept of ownership as a matter of survival or they could have truly died. I was talking to 
some elders, and, and, I, and I decided to create this test phrase just to see about this, my water and my language. And so I approached this one elder and I said, is it possible to say my water in our language? She kind of chuckled and she said, no, no, it's not possible. And, but then she stopped herself and she said, well, actually, you could say my water because if you owned a piece of land and that water went through it, then you could say my water. But then she didn't have an example prior to land ownership. And I knew that my people had to take on this concept of ownership. I was visiting with my friend, another colleague, and, and I was telling her about this realizations I was having around this not being able to say my water, and she said, she said, well, of course, of course, April, of course you can't say my water because sawalk, our word, our Salish word for water, sawalk, the root word means to ask. And when she told me that, I realized that this word had never been properly translated for me because I had taken water for granted this whole time, my whole life. I had used it to bathe in, to wash, to wash clothes, to quench my thirst. It was a thing that I could possess or own and use how I liked. That was water to me. And when she said that, the root word was to ask. I imagine my ancestors having this connection to land in a way that I didn't understand because they knew that water was so vital that we would cease to exist without it. So you had to ask to use it. And so from that, my worldview just has begun to open. And it took me back to that day with my niece. And I thought about how different my words would have been with my niece, had I not had the concept of ownership. Perhaps I would have said things like, wow, what a beautiful connection you are having with this bug. What is this bug telling you? What is it teaching you? And so at this point in time, I now have this huge opportunity this huge opportunity to revitalize not only my language, but the values and concepts, the deeper meaning of my language that goes with it. And I can teach my baby a world without ownership and to teach him how to be more connected to the world rather than just owning pieces of it. Lem Lemsh.